Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Being in Time, Martin Heidegger has introduced this, this term, Dasein, for essentially human being, and he tells us that we need to carry out an existential analysis of Dasein. A little bit later, he's going to talk in terms of interpretation, and that becomes a very important term and, and concept in this work. Why is interpretation so central? Dasein is the being that can be concerned about its own being, but it's also the being that understands other beings and understands the being of being. Uh, that may be a little bit unclear at this point, but you know the, the analysis. Uh, try it all again. In being in time, Martin Heidegger takes the fundamental inquiry that the entire work is concerned with to be, uh, at least in part, an existential analysis of Dasein. I'll try one more time. In Being in Time, one of the fundamental tasks that the entire book is attempting to carry out is an existential analysis of Dasein. And this is supposed to allow us to approach what Heidegger calls the question of being that has been uh, up until this point largely ignored or misunderstood and to reappropriate it in a not entirely novel, but, but certainly uh, originary way, getting back to the, the source, uh, uh, taking away a lot of the detritus that blocks our view of it. Heidegger is going to talk about this in terms of interpretation. This is a very important term running throughout the whole of the work. Uh, Dasein, human being, is by its very being interpretive. And what does that mean when we say interpretive? Uh, a lot of times people think that interpretation means there's something objective, fixed, and then you just have your own subjective interpretation of it. Heidegger is not working with that sort of concept. <clears throat> interpretation is in, in many respects more creative or collaborative. Even when it's uh, completely deforming something, it is still carrying out that, that agency that involves us. And this is part of the way in which we distinctively are as human beings. Heidegger, in the beginning of section uh, five, will talk about Dasein, the human being, as ontically not only what is near or even nearest, we ourselves, he says, are it, each of us. We are Dasein, right? So Dasein is human being. And he talks about this in terms of it being ontically, the dealing with the, the factuality, the, the, you know, what presents itself to us. But if we, if we start to go to the very structures of being and of our being, if we look at it ontologically, he says, for this reason, Dasein is ontologically what is furthest removed. He says, it, it, it belongs to its most proper being to have an understanding of this being. So we always have some conception of what we are. And indeed, it goes beyond just, you know, a solipsistic what I am and extends to what it is that that human being in general is. Now, it could be completely mistaken understanding, although it's actually impossible for it to be completely mistaken from a Heideggerian perspective. 
But we always have some sort of interpretation going on. So he says we have an understanding of this being and we sustain a certain interpretation of it. And he says this does not mean that the most readily available pre-ontological, before we carry out this inquiry, interpretation of its own being could be adopted as an adequate guideline. Why can't we adopt that as an adequate guideline? Because if we do, <clears throat> we are, you might say, skewing the inquiry from the beginning. We're putting on a certain kind of blinder or filter. We want to try to carry out an interpretation that goes to the realities or things themselves, as phenomenology had, had uh, taken as its slogan. So Dasein, human being, is the being that understands being and beings, understands not in the sense of comprehensively gets everything completely right, but has some sort of understanding, has something that it's working with, and it understands its own being. The goal here is in part, as Heidegger is going to say a little bit later, is that we must choose a manner of access an interpretation so that this being can show itself to itself on its own terms. So we can do so in a, you know, more adequate way. Now, Heidegger says we already have a number of candidates for interpretations of Dasein, of human being. And he tells us, uh, here we go. Not only does an understanding of being belong to Dasein, this, this understanding also develops or decays according to the actual manner of being of Dasein at any given time. So the understanding can get, get greater and can get lesser. Then he goes on and he gives us a list of different disciplines. He says philosophical psychology, anthropology, ethics, politics, poetry, biography, and historiography pursue in different ways and to varying extents. So each of them is doing its own thing. Now notice what he says here, the behavior, faculties, powers, possibilities, and destinies of Dasein. Each of these disciplines or bodies of work or human activities, modes of inquiry, is in fact revealing to us something that does belong to Dasein. But it's not revealing to us the entirety of it. And there's a danger in taking this as a starting point, any of these disciplines, of prejudicing the inquiry from the very beginning. So he goes on and he says, The question remains whether these interpretations were carried out in as original an existential manner as their existential, meaning from the possibilities of Dasein, originality perhaps merited. Now, he's, he's actually giving a compliment there. He's saying each of these is important. Each of these does, in fact, reveal to us possibilities of Dasein. They just simply don't reveal to us all of them, and they don't go deep enough. So let's think about what each of these would, would include and what we might also add to the list today. Philosophical psychology, many people don't really know this, but psychology was originally a discipline within philosophy that had to do with the soul, the psuche, right? And then it extended to dealing with, you know, thoughts and, and, and emotions and the relations between them and how we are formed by our environment or formed by other determinants. And what happens to us when we, you know, undergo a trauma or, you know, what is normal human development? All of that actually fits into philosophical psychology. You know, much of the, the good psychology that's out there that, that is aware of its own origins and sometimes its own limitations tends to be philosophical. Anthropology. Now, when you hear the word anthropology, you may have different things in mind, you may be thinking, for example, about people engaging in archaeological investigation or talking about uh, various bones and measuring them and trying to figure out, you know, what the missing link between uh, these things is or going out and doing ethnographic studies in various cultures. There's a number of different anthropologies at this point, all connected together in the fact that they are a study of human beings. Ethics. You might not think of ethics 
as actually being a mode of disclosure of Dasein, but that's the way Heidegger conceives of it. It is indeed, once we adopt ethical perspectives and start to raise ethical concerns, we are thinking, we are interpreting within the horizon, right? Same thing with politics. And notice that he's treating them in, in different ways. And, and historically, we have often distinguished these two. Poetry. Now, doesn't that seem like a strange addition to this list? And yet, why do people read poems? What do they get out of it? Is it to you know, go to poetry slams and make a big stir and you know, make a political statement or something like that? Poetry, Heidegger thinks, has a great capacity to reveal to us beings in a very different light. He's particularly interested in people like who they're in, right? But, you know, at the time that he's writing this, uh, one of the great poets uh, of the 20th century, uh, you know, Rainer Maria Rilke, most of his stuff is actually out there and, and available. Biography. Why is biography a way of revealing to us an interpretation of Dasein? Isn't it just about that one person there? Well, it's about a person in his or her milieu, in engagement with other persons, within a kind of uh, history. So it reveals to us something more than just a, a person in isolation. This is why Plutarch's parallel lives can still be relevant to us today. Historiography. Why not just history there? Why historiography? The uh, discipline that is, you might say, at a slightly higher meta level where history is concerned with how indeed history is carried out. Is it being done in a more objective way? Is it focusing on the culture of the everyday person as opposed to the battles of the lords? Uh, how do we know that historical documents actually give us something like a, an unvarnished interpretation of, of things, right? All of that fits in there. All of these are ways of interpreting the world and Dasein in relation to it. Heidegger says we have to put all of those aside for the time being. What then do we take as our starting point? So he says, um, the problem of gaining and securing the kind of access that leads to Dasein is, is really crucial. Expressed negatively, no arbitrary idea of being in reality, no matter how self-evident it is, may be brought to bear on this being in a dogmatically constructed way. No categories prescribed by such ideas may be forced on Dasein without ontological deliberation. So what can we do then? Well, Heidegger talks here about the everyday and the average, right? He says, the matter of access and interpretation has to be chosen. It has to be selected in such a way that this being can show itself on its own terms. So the passage we've brought up before. So he says, this manner should show that being as it is initially, and for the most part, in what he calls its average everydayness. So we need to look at how people do, in fact, live, experience, uh, interact with the world, understand each other and the world. So he says, not arbitrary and accidental structures, but essential ones are to be demonstrated in this everydayness. He goes on and says, structures that remain determinate in every mode of factual Dasein. So, you know, this is something that should, in theory at least, stretch back and encompass pretty much all of humanity and human experience. Not to say that every single experience is exactly like what Heidegger is sketching out, but these structures, these ontological structures that the existential analysis of Dasein are going to be revealing to us about everydayness can be found, he would say, within every cultural situation. Does that mean that we simply begin by being in the world and looking around and seeing, you know, writing little memoirs about what our day is like? No, we have to go deeper. We have to follow a leading clue. And that leading clue is what he calls temporality, Zeitlichkeit, being in time or being, you might say, of time and with time. So he, he goes on and he says the meaning of the being, of that being that we call Dasein, proves to be temporality. 
We repeat our interpretation of these structures of Dasein, this time as modes of temporality. So much of this work is actually going to be investigating what time and temporality are for us, how we interpret time and thereby how we interpret being and how we interpret ourselves. He, he goes on and he says, um, Dasein is in such a way that by being, it understands something like being. We must show that time is that from which Dasein tacitly understands and interpret something like being at all. So it's not as if you have being first and after that time. No, you only get being by having time. He goes on a little bit uh, more in in that, that section and he says, time has long served as the ontological and then he takes it back. He says, no, no, ontic, criterion for naively distinguishing different regions of being, for carrying out regional ontologies or attempting a total ontology. Temporal beings are separated from atemporal beings, right? What are temporal beings? Natural processes, historical events, beings like you and I. Separated from atemporal beings, spatial and numerical relationships. We are, he says, we're accustomed to distinguishing the timeless meaning of propositions from the temporal course of propositional statements. For example, he doesn't use this, it is day right now. Actually, true, at the time that I'm filming this, who knows what it is at the time that you're watching this? And it's not true if you're on the other side of the, the world, is it? And yet, the phrase, it is day right now, has a meaning separable from the current time-bound meaning, doesn't it? So we make these sorts of distinctions. How is it that we do this? Heidegger says that, what we're going to do is, uh, he says, we must show on the basis of the question of the meaning of being that and in what way the central range of problems of all ontology is rooted in the phenomenon of time, correctly viewed and correctly explained. So this means that all of this must be interpreted or rather reinterpreted in terms of of an adequately developed understanding of temporality, that is one of the main goals of Heidegger's work here in Being and Time. 